October 20th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Jeremiah chapter 52 from the Old Testament. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he ruled in Jerusalem for 11 years. His mother's name was Hamutal, daughter of Jeremiah from Libna. He did what displeased the Lord, just as Jehoiakim had done. What follows is a record of what happened to Jerusalem and Judah because of the Lord's anger when he drove them out of his sight. Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came against Jerusalem with his whole army and set up camp outside it. They built siege ramps all around it. He arrived on the tenth day of the tenth month in the ninth year that Zedekiah ruled over Judah. The city remained under siege until Zedekiah's eleventh year. By the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine in the city was so severe the residents had no food. They broke through the city walls and all the soldiers tried to escape. They left the city during the night. They went through the gate between the two walls that is near the king's garden. The Babylonians had the city surrounded. Then they headed for the Jordan Valley. But the Babylonian army chased after the king. They caught up with Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho, and his entire army deserted him. They captured him and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, in the territory of Hamath, and he passed sentence on him there. The king of Babylon had Zedekiah's sons put to death while Zedekiah was forced to watch. He also had all the nobles of Judah put to death there at Riblah. He had Zedekiah's eyes put out and had him bound in chains. Then the king of Babylon had him led off to Babylon, and he was imprisoned there until the day he died. On the tenth day of the fifth month, in the nineteenth year of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the royal guard who served the king of Babylon, arrived in Jerusalem. He burned down the Lord's temple the royal palace, and all the houses in Jerusalem, including every large house. The whole Babylonian army that came with the captain of the royal guard tore down the walls that surrounded Jerusalem. Nebuzaradan, the captain of the royal guard, took into exile some of the poor, the rest of the people who remained in the city, those who had deserted to him, and the rest of the craftsmen. But he left behind some of the poor and gave them fields and vineyards. The Babylonians broke the two bronze pillars in the temple of the Lord, as well as the movable stands and the large bronze basin, called the sea. They took all the bronze to Babylon. They also took the pots, shovels, trimming shears, basins, pans, and all the bronze utensils used by the priest. The captain of the royal guard took the gold and silver bowls, censers, basins, pots, lampstands, pans, and vessels. The bronze of the items that King Solomon made for the Lord's temple, including the two pillars, the large bronze basin called the sea, the twelve bronze bowls under the sea, and the movable stands, was too heavy to be weighed. Each of the pillars was about 27 feet high, about 18 feet in circumference, three inches thick and hollow. The bronze top of one pillar was about seven and one half feet high and had bronze lattice work and pomegranate shaped ornaments all around it. The second pillar with its pomegranate shaped ornaments was like it. There were 96 pomegranate shaped ornaments on the sides. In all, there were 100 pomegranate shaped ornaments over the lattice work that went around it. The captain of the royal guard took Sarea, the chief priest, Zephaniah, the priest who was second in rank, and the three doorkeepers. From the city he took an official who was in charge of the soldiers, seven of the king's advisors who were discovered in the city, an official army secretary who drafted citizens for military service, and sixty citizens who were discovered in the middle of the city. Nebuzaradan, the captain of the royal guard, took them and brought them to the king of Babylon at Riblah. The king of Babylon ordered them to be executed at Riblah, in the territory of Hamath. So Judah was taken into exile away from its land. 
Here is the official record of the number of people Nebuchadnezzar carried into exile. In the seventh year, 3,023 Jews. In Nebuchadnezzar's 18th year, 832 people from Jerusalem. In Nebuchadnezzar's 23rd year, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the royal guard, carried into exile 745 Judeans. In all, 4,600 people went into exile. In the 37th year of the exile of King Jehoiakim of Judah, on the 25th day of the 12th month, evil Merodach, in the first year of his reign, pardoned King Jehoiakim of Judah and released him from prison. He spoke kindly to him and gave him a more prestigious position than the other kings who were with him in Babylon. Jehoiakim took off his prison clothes and ate daily in the king's presence for the rest of his life. He was given daily provisions by the king of Babylon for the rest of his life until the day he died. God, thank you for the book of Jeremiah. It is one of my favorite books because Jeremiah seems so real. It's not that the other people aren't real people, obviously, but Jeremiah seems to struggle in all his humanness as a, as a Christian, as a missionary. Uh, he was a prophet, but he had it really hard. And he saw the despair all around him, and yet he continued to find hope and a future with you. Jeremiah reading the words comfort me when I'm struggling with things allowing me to realize that yes you've said that it's not going to be comfortable you never said it was going to be easy you said that I would need to persevere through things uh, and this year has definitely taught me that probably more so than any other time almost any other time in my life and some of the same words that Jeremiah used and some of the same emotions uh, in this chapter in the in this book in the Bible are some of the same ones that I've used. You know, Jeremiah saw so many things in his life. He had a very long career as a prophet and he started off his career as a prophet uh, in hope. Uh, Josiah had just come to to power and they uh, he was all about getting rid of the idols and, and uh, getting the temple set back up and they found uh, what was probably uh, early edition of the book of Deuteronomy and it just set Josiah on fire and all these things were happening and Jeremiah uh, was beginning to preach and do his ministry and, and there was hope and there was hope for the people who believed in you, God, who worshipped you, who followed you. And then when King Josiah was killed and his son was put in power, his son Jehoiakim was put into power, everything fell apart, not only back to where it was before, but I, I think it was actually worse. And idols were once again the name of the game. And you put Jeremiah front and center in the middle of all of this kind of despair a and instead of preaching hope he preached more despair um, he preached the truth if you don't change your ways this is what's going to happen and it was only words of despair to those who didn't want to hear them to your loyal followers and I know there was a remnant still there these were words that that they knew were truth as well but perhaps because they had been under oppression for such a long time, um, sometimes it's easier to worship various idols. And if one idol doesn't please you, move on to the next one. There's all sorts of reasons that this could happen. But the most important thing is that they weren't worshiping you. They weren't following you. And Jeremiah comes in in the middle of this and says, I need you to change your ways. I'm here from God. And he's begging you to change your ways. And I know, God, if they had changed their ways, none of the rest of those things would have happened. Not the confirmation of the siege, not the confirmation of the exile happening, not the 70 years, not the eventual destruction of Babel Babylon itself. None of those things would have happened if they had just turned to you, if they had just placed their trust in you. And yet we see Jeremiah do exactly that. 
He had hope at the beginning of his ministry, a chance that the temple was coming back to its full glory and that all of that was destroyed. Um, And things just kept getting worse and getting worse. And he kept looking to you and looking to you for confirmation that he should continue to say what exactly what he's saying. And, you know, some of his desperate cries to you, God, of God, are are you serious? (laughs) You really want me to go back in there and say these things? Okay, I will, because I believe in you, and I believe in what you're doing, and I believe there's hope. But really, because some of the stuff is probably going to get me killed. And we know that Jeremiah had a very rough life, um, amongst many things, almost drowning in a cistern, which I can't even imagine drowning in a bunch of icky, muddy, junk, garbage, yuck. But even through all of that, even though his, his ministry, his, his prophetic speeches, uh, his coming up against authority over and over again, even though that was incredibly difficult in his life, and it felt like in his entire ministry that nobody ever listened to him except maybe a few close friends, he never gave up. And to me, that's astounding after all the things that Jeremiah went through and all the things he saw are there things that I will never see in my lifetime. I have no doubt. He never gave up. And it's because he kept going back to what he knew about you in the midst of crazy things happening, in the midst of a two-year war, in the midst of um, having to come to court and knowing full well that what he's going to say is going to make the king so mad that potentially he could kill Jeremiah even in the midst of all that he just kept going back to who you are God and who you were to him his faith to me is one of the strongest in the Bible and and we talk about you know the faith of David and the faith of Abraham but to me the faith of Jeremiah without question has to be the one that I relate the most to that in the barrenness of his ministry and in the threat of violence against him, Jeremiah always seemed to have this amazing peace and strength, superhuman strength, and this ability to continue to be in front of those in power saying exactly what you'd asked Jeremiah to do. And we know that all of those things came from you. God, now that we're done reading Jeremiah, I just ask that you continue to bless my ministry and the other ministries around the world that that are of you. That even though we will be under persecution by the world, without a doubt, and we'll be taking the task for many things and sometimes we'll even be persecuted by fellow Christians, that no matter what, that we continually look back to you and what we know about you to be true, the consistency of who you are. And that those are the things that we believe in and and we don't let this drama of the world who tries to tear down these, these ministries, even though they may not be words they want to hear, that we just go back to what you have asked us to do. Be obedient and I'll take care of you. Be obedient, I'll take care of you. I know, God, that that doesn't mean my path is suddenly easy and that I'll take care of you part. But it does know that I don't have to despair. Because just like Jeremiah knew, I know that you are always with me. That you are not leaving me. That you support, encourage, and provide strength for this this ministry. And I'm incredibly blessed because I see tons and tons of fruit from the Daily Video Bible. Whereas Jeremiah saw very little fruit from his ministry, and yet he still persevered every single day, saying exactly what he knew he had to say against popular thought of the day. One of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite authors, Francis Chan, is, Something is wrong when our lives make sense to unbelievers. God, continue to provide that strength and that support and that encouragement to go out into a world that does not want to hear us and allow our words to be said in a way that opens up hearts. Allow the power of what you have sent us to do, the love you have put inside of us and the grace and the mercy reflect 
in our actions and in our words so that others want to listen. They may still not agree with us, but at least that they are listening. And I know that you open up hearts in ways that we can't even imagine. And all we need to do is be obedient and you will take care of the rest. God, thank you for such powerful books like the book of Jeremiah that you have put in in your word to help teach us what you expect of us and how to do it. In your son's name I pray. Amen.